<laughs> That's why I always mute myself. Yeah. <laughs> what time? I, I I think it was, I think it was this club. We were having a meeting, a Zoom meeting, and Ernesto was on there. Oh no, it was a, it was a different club, but I was attending that one, and my dog started barking, and uh, so Ernesto Sandoval, um, he was kind of like hmm, you know, but he didn't. He was polite, and so the next meeting, he was there, and somebody else's dog was barking, and uh, Ernesto says, "Hey James, is that your dog again?" <laughs> I said, not this time. <laughs> well, I have I have a dog next door, and a couple of friends have told me that when he starts in, they can hear it. So I usually just mute because it, it, the dog always makes noise, and I think yeah. it's very you know disruptive. So and that yes. way, if if somebody comes in the room and says something, you know. Yeah, Gary you know. Duke thing. He has a dog next door that. Donnie, it looks like you just reconnected, but you're on mute. So just unmute if there if you can. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Bam, you got it. <laughs> All right. Yay. Now, why is that so small? Just we're gonna hold on a second. Now let me see if I can share the everything here. <laughs> okay, so on your um, on your um, the one you're showing the video from. Yeah. If you can mute that because you're having some feedback. So if you can mute yourself on that one, not on not on your cell phone, but on your computer, if you can mute your computer. Because we're hearing some feedback. Hold on one second. How about now? Oh, better. Yeah, I think you could just hear the speaker in the background from that. Yeah, um, you could. You gonna try sharing your screen? Yeah, let's see here. Why is it small? Can you hear me still? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Well, we're live on YouTube, everybody. All right. Can you, can you see the screen? Yep. All right. We ready to go then? Okay. Well. Um, First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting. Sorry for the little delay. We just had a technical difficulty that uh, between uh, the 20 of us, we got to figure it out. So uh, anyway, I'd like to introduce you to you, uh, Don and Donnie. Uh, they're going to pre present uh, Cactus of Colorado. And uh, without further ado, Don and Donnie, go ahead and take it over. Uh, hi, I'm Don. I'm Donnie's dad. I'm the main author of the Cactus of Colorado book, which we'll be telling you about. Um, what, let me tell you how I started with the book. And if you, you know Paniote, Paniote Caladius of uh, the Denver Botanical Garden, uh, he, this is my garden right here in my front yard in Pueblo, Colorado. And he kept pestering me to write a book. But there's so many gardening books, I decided to do a book about the cactus of Colorado, which was pub there was a book published in 1940. It's a little outdated. This is my yard from about 20 years ago. Um, here's from a, about a couple years ago. There's over a thousand cactus and I have about 110 species, varies from year to year. At one time we had 140 species of penstemon. This is the yard in a, in a very wet year. Some years there, there's no, hardly anything up when it's super dry. Uh, our high temperature in the summer in the 90s and hundreds, the lows get down to the 60s. Um, um, in the winter time, we are in the teens for lows. Highs are be anywhere from 40s to 60s. The coldest has ever gotten here is minus 23, um, but that hasn't happened in 20 years. Normally, we'd get down to minus 10 every year, at least once or twice. But thanks to global warming, in that sense, uh, uh, we have we haven't got below zero in five or six years. Uh, this is my house in 1997. This is what it looked like before. Um, I had to splice two pictures together to, to show you what it looks like. And with typical three bedroom home, crappy uh, grass yard, got tired of mowing it and 
my parents had moved to Las Vegas and we'd go visit them and you'd show those nice landscape, zeroscape landscapes and a lot of their public buildings. And I, I wanted to do that because I, I like cactus. My neighbors thought I was crazy though. Here's what it looks like. This is like last year. I also have uh, like 18 species of agave and about 10 species of yuccas. So when I first started to make the garden, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know too much about cold hardiness. So I assumed that, you know, every cactus in Colorado would be cold hardy, which they are. So I want to know how many species of cactus are there in Colorado? I, just wanted, I wanted to get every species part of my garden. Now, like I said, there was a book, Colorado Cacti, published in 1940 by Charles Bosevain. Um, he lived in Colorado Springs. This is his little cactus garden there. In his book, he had 25 species. And under current nomenclature, that it was 18 species. And then if you look up in Benson's book and look at all the range maps, uh, he had 17 species. And in our book, after we finished uh, doing it after several years, we came up with 24 species. And that was on using conservative, conservative uh, nomenclature. So uh, when everybody thinks of Colorado, they think of the Ro Colorado Rockies and the, this is the Elk Range viewed from Cottonwood Pass on the Continental Divide at 12,000 feet. But uh, yeah, Colorado here sits situated in the uh, center of the west center of the US. So, you know, uh, well, actually only about 25%, uh, 30% of the state is mountains going down the middle. The whole Eastern side, 45% is high plains. And then on the far Western part is mostly uh, plateaus, and uh, mesas and valleys. Here's another. Here's where we, we live in Pueblo, right there, about 110 miles south of Denver, Colorado Springs, where the uh, National Convention was supposed to be this year, but it got moved, got to be there, Texas Convention in two years. And the yellow is all plains, the gray is mountains, gray and black, pinks over here are plateaus and mesas. And now we'll start talking about cacti instead of Colorado. And this is the largest cactus in Colorado, the uh, the choya, the tree choya, cylindrical bricata. Tongue tied there. Um, it, they care, this plant is about four and a half feet tall. This is only like a quarter mile from my house. And they're noted for their really bright uh, flowers. They get a woody skeleton. So they are like a real tree bush. And they get a yellow fruit. It stays on it ripen about uh, August and uh, they'll stay on to all the way to the to uh, early spring. A lot of times people think these are the flowers because they're on for so long. Um, there is one a white very found in the Phantom Canyon, Colorado, in Fremont County. Um, this is right growing over a desert four o'clock. Here's a regular typical beautiful magenta flower. You see all the pollen on there, and it's just a regular. European honeybee on it. And the range is Southeast Colorado. Again, here's Pueblo. And it's found, it's found out to almost uh, 6,000 feet. A little more than that, about 6,800 feet. Look at anything. And here's the overall range. Down into Mexico, following all the way down into Mexico. And then uh, we have another species of choya. Uh, Slumber, Slumber, the Plateau Choya, Slumberoputio Whippoli, and he gets like a yellow green, bright yellow green. Uh, it's more of a mat forming uh, Choya compared to the tree Choya. And here's the whole plant. This is down by the Four Corners National, Mo Four Corners Monument, um, right along the San Juan River. This is the San Juan River right here. This is uh, in, near Pagosa Springs, Colorado. These these hills right here are actually in New Mexico. Here's the same hillside, a little different. Thing. You can see them all blooming. And this is in uh, like June. The fruits there are a lot smaller. They're not as bright. It, they stay on the plant for like two or three years. And here's its range just down in Durango, Colorado, right there, uh, the southwest corner of the state. And then here's the overall range. The range maps are from the floor of North America. And it's actually it's found over here in Utah too. Their map is a little- In Nevada. And Nevada. And then we discovered 
a new hybrid species of Choya. Uh, there are several records for Slinger Punta Imbricata over in the southwest part of the state. Went over there to look at them and uh, hap to, happened to notice, well, they're not Imbricata at all. They look way different. They're actually a hybrid between Whippoli and Imbricata. Imbricata um, was moved there by the an ancestral Pueblo people. And you find these hybrid plants near Anasazi ruins, Pueblo ruins. And the type locality of Chimney Rock there, uh, there's ruin. There's actually ruins all over the place. And then it has more of a pinkish flower. We found six plants that have yellow flowers. Um, the type locality is right there along this highway. And if you notice, they're a little lighter, a lighter pinkish red compared to the Imbricata. But these plants are all sterile. They've hybridized back and forth I, for hundreds of years, maybe more than without a thousand, and they've become sterile. And you'll see some of the plants like right here, um, they have a very strong thigmonastic, uh, seismonastic response. They produce tons of flowers, but the fruit, there's a dry fruit you can barely see right there. You cut them open and they have no seed in them. For the most part, we figured out that they're uh, male sterile because in the garden setting, they'll accept imbricata pollen, but in the wild, there is no imbricata anymore. Just this hybrid and occasionally whippoli nearby. So it makes them naturally sterile in the wild. Um, it, I was able to track it down to where they were around the uh, around the Anasazi Pueblo one group of people. So I could find ruins and just kind of track locations by ruins and that. And I've been trying to give information to some of the um, anthropological people or you know the people studying the thing, but they haven't been as interested in cactus as I think they should be. And they probably used to plant for some kind of ceremonial use. I know the Zuni Indians are, are big using Imbricata uh, as a ceremonial plant. They also ate the buds of the plants. And uh, here's a good comparison of, uh, here's an Imbricata again. You can see the tons of uh, pollen down there. And the Anasazi has like no pollen. This, the red plants produce just a very tiny bit of pollen, but it's sterile. And the, the yellow flowers, <clears throat> produce no pollen at all. And uh, here's the, here's where we've, the dots where we found. Uh, yeah, we put Vered Floris in there as a comparison because a lot of people like to lump this under Vered Flora, but uh, Vered Flora has got different parents for hybrids. That's probably debatable, but uh, for the most part, the Four Corners plants are separated from the uh, Santa Fe Choya. This was just kind of, you can see the the, uh, the sites that there's Indian or indigenous people ruins and Choya spots. Some of those where there's question marks, I could find herbarium specimens for Choyas, but they don't exist anymore. Yeah, there's a it, house there, or there's a farm there, and that site has been wiped out. Are you saying that these plants are actually right at the Anastasi locations? And you feel yeah, they were planted by the Anastasis? Yeah they're, yeah, they're feet away from pit houses or ruins. Some places they're like a half a mile away. There's a there's a big group in the middle near Hovenweep. I was yeah, just going to yeah. say that I recognize some of the dots like Hovenweep and Farmington and those areas and and, and would the others be like Chuckle Canyon? Were they in the Chuckle Canyon area also? Yeah, there is. There is, and there's also the the um, yeah, Chuckle Canyon there. Uh, looks like Window the Rock area, maybe the other dot there, Window Rock. Uh, one yeah. of these over here, like the. The far west one over there is like by Tasegi Cayente area. Yeah, sure, that's, yeah. That's there by the Navajo National Monument. Yeah, Navajo National Monument. Then right, also, right. someone wrote a paper about Cylindra Puntia Vered Flores in Canyon de Shea. Well, they should be Anasaziensis. At one time, everything was, Vered Flores seems to be a catch all for hybrids in this group. But uh, so the, the lower dot in Arizona is Canyon de Shea? Yeah. This one right, uh, right there. Yeah, that one right there should be Canyon Deshaies. And the, the one on the border up above is Hovenweep, correct? Yeah, yeah there's right Hoven, Hovenweep. Hovenweep. Uh, wow. Then there's other, there's a few others in that area. Uh, that's that's interesting. Butler Wash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's several up in Combs that. Combs Ridge and Bears Ears. Bears Ears. And this is just along the 
San Juan River. There's ruins right there. Too. Yeah, there's stuff right along the river and that. And then there's there's her bearing specimens for like somebody saw one plant growing in the in the middle of the river from after it flooded and stuff like that. And well, you have to put it in there. It was good. It was a good record. You know what I mean? I, I haven't actually seen that specimen, but most of these we have. That's interesting. And he talked about the flowers here. Yeah, and then the flower morphology, I, I wanted to uh, show the differences in the, the thing. Virid floris is, is a fertile plant, so you can, it, it can be, it can cross back and forth with imbricata. Whereas the Anasaziensis, there is no imbricata in the wild anymore. They're, they've been hybridized with whippleye. But uh, on, a, on a note, Virid flora more than likely is Davisii crossed with imbricata because Whippoli doesn't exist in Santa Fe. Yeah, we're working on a New Mexico book, which hopefully will be done by next year. We've been saying that for uh, like two years. Yeah. And then the, the pandemic didn't, it. we couldn't go to New Mexico, but once this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll, we'll get out of Cylindro Puntia now. Yeah. Um, we did find a new record for Colorado. Mammillaria miacantha was not found in Colorado until we did our study. And uh, that's the only mammillaria we found in the state. We only found like nine plants. And it's an extreme southeast part of the state, like three miles from the New Mexico border, and like a mile from the Oklahoma border, down by the three corners of Colorado. Here it is growing in habitat, pinion juniper. Uh, it's growing there with uh, a kind of serious veered flora. There's some smaller plants. Um, we've been back there several times. We had to go like three or four times before we actually found one blooming. And this is one blooming it with uh, uh, fruits at the same time. And they, this is the habitat. They're actually, that's pictures. They're right up here along this ridge. This is little black mesa. And they're growing, they're growing right in the area here with the pinion juniper habitat. And here's the range from Florida of North America. And our spot is this red dot right there. This other red dot is near uh, Cimarron by Boy Scout camps out the Rat Tone. There, that's another, that's the farthest north spot we ever seen it, have seen it at. A very similar plant though, Escobaria missouriensis. Uh, it's fairly common along the foothills of the Eastern Colorado Front Range. Uh, here's your yellow flowers. This was like about early May, the red fruits. A lot of times you see these plants because you see their red fruits. They're very small. These are all like the size of a uh, quarter. Quarter. They're growing with Selaginella. This is a place called Phantom Canyon. has a lot of cacti. It's about 40 miles west of Pueblo. Um, the, this picture, you can really see the nice aerial groove that Escobarias and Coriophantus have. And it also shows you how the uh, radial spines are almost on a plane flat in the same plane. Occasionally they'll have one central spine. Usually they have none though. Yeah, here's a, here's a plant the size of a dime. Give you a good idea. And they're growing in, this is Pikes Peak granite. A lot of times they'll grow in spots where uh, leaves and soil has formed down in the cracks. This is one growing in limestone, kind of an unusual place to find them. Uh, and has a little, I don't know if the, Flower color, different flower covers due to the substrate they're growing in. And they got a nice habitat picture here. This is Pikes Peak back there. It gives you an idea. It's about 40 miles away from this spot. And they're growing in, in uh, limestone. I've probably been to this. This is not far from where we live. I've been to this spot probably 20 times and never saw them. Then we had a really wet year where we got uh, several inches more. And I noticed them, look at all these plants. That's right by where we always parked to go hiking. And there was at least 25 plants. That spot's right there. And it's found right down the front range, over here down towards the Raton Mesa. And there's another population on the southwest corner of the state. And here's a, here's a map. Uh, this is probably one of the most common cacti in Escobaria vivipara, spiny star. Super common, easy to grow. Uh, here it is in habitat to get nice light light pink to dark pink flowers. Uh, there are several described uh, varieties, subspecies. This is one called Neomexicana. It gets, new, it gets a lot more radial spines, gives it the white uh, overall appearance of the plant. It and subspecies Arizonica, which this is 
an unusual colored plant, they can still have the same solid pink flowers. They tend to get a lot more stems, multi-stem plants. And the fruits are anywhere from the light tan to yellow to even a, a light red, but usually they're this color. And then they'll just dry to a, a dark tan. And the fruit are edible. I've had several people taste them. They say they taste good, but uh, after cleaning enough seeds of Escobaria vivipara, I don't know if I want to taste them. It's quite a sticky jelly substance that comes out of them. Um, yeah, you see how common it is, especially higher in the Eastern Plains, it's all over. Uh, if you notice there's some counties don't have any dots. Well, some of these counties here, like this is Washington County, it's all farmland and there's no public land or there's like one state wildlife area, it's just a lake. That happens to clear across the whole far Eastern part of the state is mostly farmland. Um, here in the Southwest, it doesn't go up to the Northeast for some own reason. Northwest. Northwest, excuse me. And uh, you do that. And here's here's the overall range. It's from clear up to Canada down into Mexico. Um, this is a uh, a very what was it coveted plant? Yeah. This is kind of a rare plant, but not in Colorado. It's super common. The mountain ball cactus, P.U. cactus Simpsoni. They get this this plant here is about the size of a baseball, and it. It's found up to almost uh, 11,000 feet in Colorado. This is in uh, Chafee County. Mm -hmm. These are both 14,000 foot peaks here, Mount Chavano and Tabowich. This is an open meadow. And this, this plant here is about uh, a little bigger than a softball. This, and this is in June. This elevation there. The, the elevation right here is like 9,200 feet. I always want them to tell the elevation on that because that's 9,000 feet and the mountains are still huge behind them. And it, it's not, it's not like I said, found up to about 10,500. It isn't found much higher than that because it's all heavily forest and there's not really any open places for them to grow. If they are found really at those elevations. They're always found on rocky south facing slopes. This is about two miles down, the, down from that spot. And as you can see, there's hundreds of plants. And it goes for miles like this along this road in Chafee County. This is BLM land growing in pinion juniper. Uh, we went last year, you can see the two 14,000 foot peaks there. Well, under the last administration, they wanted to get more money out of the land in BLM. So they cleared, clear cut sections of the pinion juniper and ripped it all out so to make room and they put cattle in there. And if you can see right there, these are some plants that were just torn up and uprooted doing all that. They did several, they'd make like uh, two or 300 yard square uh, patches where they'd clear it out. Uh, this is one that's called a uh, subspecies of variety minor. We don't believe in any of these, you can uh, subspecies of varieties of this plant. You saw that picture with the hundreds of plants. You can go through and you can find plants that have dark red, small dark red vines, this is an all white one that people call the snowball form. Well, it was growing, you know, a few feet from that other one. Here's a large uh, multi-stem plant. Uh, this is probably about a foot and a half across and it's got like a reddish brown spines. Uh, a nice blooming plant. They bloom very early, like late March to early April. As soon as the snow comes off and they get sun, they'll bloom. Um, with all those plants, there's a lot of animals going through and they get stepped on and you can find a lot of crested plants. In fact, uh, they call this a rattlesnake plant and it was thought to be a different species at one time. Uh, on the western slope, you can find plants that have yellow flowers. And actually the petals are almost more white, but they look more yellow because of the uh, anthers and amen. The fruits are like a barrel shaped little red thing and they, they fall off pretty quick. And mature, it's hard to, we like to grow this for our nursery and uh, you gotta be really quick to, to get the, the seed. The seeds are, are like, have a hard, really hard shell and they're hard to germinate. Do you wanna talk about germinating? Uh -huh. Okay. And here's the range, mostly found, it's found in the mountains on the west slope on mountains. This one dot is near Colorado Springs on places called the Palmer Divide, which is about 7,000 feet. And it divides the Arkansas and the South Platte drainages. And here's the overall range. It's very common in Colorado. Of all the, the scattered range, it's super common and most widespread in the state of Colorado. Um, another thing I wanted to, there's the same high mountain farther down the road. 
And you see right there, there's a Pediococcus simpsoni. You can find most of the Colorado's plants along roads and highways. You don't have to go hiking 10 miles to go see a plant. And I, I guess that would be because we have so many roads in the state more than anything. This is a rel relative of Pediococcus simpsoni. This is a super rare plant, Pediococcus uh, noltoni, a Knowlton's cactus. It's only found in one spot, uh, right around the Colorado, New Mexico border, uh, near a town called La Boca, Colorado, on the La Plata River. It was found in 1958 by a guy named Fred Knowlton, who, by the way, was our civil engineer, and he was building a road. And he noticed uh, the bulldozer is digging up these little quarter-sized plants. The biggest plants of these maybe is the size of a golf ball. And when he found it, they were estimated to be 100,000 plants. Well, uh, in 1960, Lyman Benson described the plant and told the location. And by 1975 or so, there was only 1,000 plants left. Um, it has, so it was put on the endangered species in 1979. The population has rebounded to about uh, 10,000 plants. And it, it grows in river rock right along the uh, small hill near the La Plata River. And you see, the, where is it at? Right there in the corner. There's a big, multi, this is a big plant, multi stem four plant, four headed plant, growing in river rock. And then the, the, the detritus of all the leaves and stuff collect there. And here's a closer up person picture. There's the fruits. This was taken a year when it was a super drought. And these things really dried up and pulled into the ground, but they still produce seed. And the this, this seed is very similar to Nolthani, uh, to Sim 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 I. And uh, this is one of my favorite cactus, the Slayer cactus in general, the whole genus I love. They're very cold hardy and heat hardy. This is one of the easiest Slayer cactus to grow. It's only found in Colorado, it's the only endemic species. Um, Slayer cactus uh, glaucus. The hookless cactus it used to be called the Uinta Basin cactus because there was a population in Utah, Uinta Basin, Utah, but they found that uh, they're separate species. This is a threatened species. It grows like in Mancos clay on the western slope near Grand Junction. Uh, some plants are real tall, can be like a foot tall. Other plants are real squat, and the squat plants were thought to be a different species called Franklin eye. And there you can see the fruit another barrel shape and there's some fruits have already broken off and you can see seeds here there's a better chance to see the seeds in the wild and this is a taller plant it's about eight inches and they get like a, a purple colored flower but they grow in this manco shale on the western slope a lot of times they'll grow under uh, shad scale shad scale atriplex there's a real nice, beautiful flowered one. This is in a place called uh, Dominguez Canyon. And all the, we've only seen one different colored flower, real pale pink flower. There you go. And here it is again, growing in this really harsh stuff. This is the Manco shale. And on top here, this is all the salt from Grand Mesa, which is, but underneath it is Manco, is uh, Manco shale clay. Here, this is Grand Mesa. This is on the western slope. This is the Gunnison River here, and they mostly grow in that really bad stuff down there underneath the mesa. The mesa here is the largest mesa in the world, supposedly. Its uh, average height is 10,000 feet. The highest point is 11,000 feet, and that's all basalt that been uplifted. This is all on the Colorado Plateau. There are plants in these side canyons off of, uh, where they're found in more, uh, what'd you say, sandy clay, mm -hmm. mixture of sandy clay sandstone and yeah here's the range it's only found this is the Colorado River this is the Gunnison River that picture was taken right in here and uh, this is another uh, slur cactus species slur cactus mesa verde another it's, this is prized by collectors I had several of these in my yard until the last few years uh, slur cactus are one of my favorite uh, genuses and they're all fairly rare, hard to grow plants. But uh, climate changes, I had all species at once several times, but we'd get really bad, too much water. Uh, where these grow, they grow again in Manco shale. And they only probably get about six inches of rain here. 
this is a place called Chimney Rock. And you can see them growing down here, the bottom of it. These yeah. little characters really love the, the uh, bad land, non-desired places that the oil people really love too. Yeah, because this is, they're not actually found on Mesa Verde. This is Mesa Verde right here. That picture was, so I was right over in here. You see these tanks over here. There's oil wells all through this area. This is actually on the Indian Reservation, the uh, Southern Ute Indian Reservation. You're not supposed to go there, but there's nobody to tell you you can't. Yeah, there's and here's a nice ground level picture. This picture uh, was taken by Woody Minnick. And there you can see Mesa Verde again. And the soil, when, it's, when it gets wet, it's really soft and sticky. But when it dries, it's hard, it like cracks and it's like as hard as concrete. Um, we've only found one blooming cat, cactus of this. And this is right along the highway again. Um, they bloom really early, like late March to early April. There's a nice picture of white creamy flowers. And the seeds, again, they have a super hard... Uh, this is one of the hardest cactus to germinate. Not only does it have a hard seed coat, once you can get it to germinate, sometimes the seed coat don't like to come off with the little cotyledon. So even though you see that these are all cracked here, there, there's still a good chance the seedlings that come from it aren't going to live. It's a real pain. I, I'm not sure how the species has done so well over the years. And again, it's also an endangered species too. Uh, it's only found in two counties in the US, one in Colorado, um, Montezuma County, and in San Juan County, the adjacent county in New Mexico. And uh, they have to, the seeds have to freeze and thaw and crack before they'll germinate. So it takes several years usually for that. Uh, this is the most widespread uh, sclerocactus, sclerocactus parviflorus very large plant, got, it's noted for the hook spines. Most of the slero cactus have the hook spines. The name parviflorus means small flower, but it is not, uh, doesn't really have small flowers. And it, it mainly grows in biological soil crust, cryptobiotic soil. This is in Colorado National Monument, and this is like uh, no, Navajo sandstone. And on top of that is a, it's accumulated this sandy clay, and they, they like to grow in that. There's another one, Sandy Clay. This is a little farther south in a place called Paradox Valley. This plant right here is about 18 inches tall. This is a picture from my garden, actually. And when, when they get watered and fertilized, they really produce a lot of flowers and seed. And you see the nice pink, purplish lavender flowers. And here's the fruits, which are usually a tan. They'll sometimes have red and they fade to tan. And again, here's the seeds again. This is from my yard. And it's found over here on the Western Slope, the Grand Junction area, the Colorado River, all the way down to uh, New, Me into New Mexico. This is a different species we'll talk about next. And here's the range of it. They show that a little overdone here. It doesn't go on that far. And it's even found over, there's a few spots in Nevada where it's found. There's probably six or seven subspecies described, but they're all the same. This is a very similar looking plant, uh, flower cactus cloverae. I mean, two the, the main difference is the flowers are more um, funnel form. They're longer. And then they have, that, this species has a really one long spine, white spine, similar to another flower cactus whippleye, which it was called, we thought it was called one. But it's flower cactus cloverae, clover's claw cactus. And it is named for, Elizabeth Clover, where she is right there. And uh, Clover and Jotter there, they discovered Slurocactus parviflorus. They were the first women to uh, successfully navigate the uh, Colorado River through the Grand, the Grand Canyon in 1938. And in 1938, they discovered Slurocactus parviflorus. Um, she was a professor um, from the University of um, Michigan. She was 40 years old. Lois Jotter was her uh, graduate student. She was like 24. Uh, and Lois, uh, like I said, she was 40 years old when she went through. Uh, Lois Jotter uh, lived to be 99. And she later went through the Grand Canyon uh, back in the 80s with an uh, expedition to see the changes that had been done by the Glen, to the, fa the flora and fauna by the uh, Glen Canyon Dam. Um, Clover eye is much more spiny than the overall, generally, than uh, 
Pagoflorus. Here's a little small plant. This one was thought to be a different species, subspecies because it's so small, but they can bloom when they're two years old. This one is also commonly called Gradii. Sometimes it's sub, under subspecies Brachii. Brachii is a Steve Black. And uh, well, there, there's a more recent genetic paper that shows that there's they're no different than regular Cloverae, but there are several different genetic forms of Cloverae now, but they're not different enough yet to separate out, I believe. More work is done on, needed on that. And, and here, here uh, this is a new dot right here for it, clear up here near um, it, Yellow Jacket, Colorado. This was part of that study Donnie was just talking about. The genetic study, they, they compared it to uh, part of the floors to see how closely they related in the different forms. And by genetics, they found that there was there's one up here. And here's the range. They have that going a little too far up in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go quite that far down in New Mexico. It has a very small range there. Uh, this is uh, at Conoceros Fendleri, Fendler's Hedgehog. This is one of my favorite cactus too. They, they get a big, huge, colorful flower. Here it is. This is in the Phantom Canyon. You can see the pink flower, red magenta flower. Let me go, go back. Um, Fender Rye is noted for the long central spine. It's a long black central spine of most species. Uh, this is near Canyon City. This is about 30 miles east of where we live, west of where we live. You see it grown with the prickly pears. This is the farthest known population in its range. It's kind of a disjunct relic population. Yeah, here you can see the, the, the darker inner flower, the lighter outer flower. It typically grows in grassland. This one though is growing underneath. So this is from the Western slope. You see the black central spine, but over there, uh, there this is near Mesa Verde, in fact, it's growing underneath a juniper tree. You can see all the scales of the juniper and they have probably because it's mostly in shade, it's got a lot smaller flowers, uh, aerial, not aerials, uh, radial spines. And uh, I see how big the flower is compared. The plant is probably about three and a half inches tall and the flower is almost as big as that. Fruits, fruits are edible. They get a red edible fruit. Uh, and all kind of cirruses, the uh, spines are uh, deciduous. That was from my yard. Yeah, and all those pictures from Fremont County right here, this is the farthest location down north. The other ones, it's barely found in these in canyons along Mesa Verde in Southwest Colorado. And this is what flora of North America has for its range. It is not found for between, we've looked numerous places between Fremont County and Santa Fe. And this is not found anywhere near there. Um, this is probably one of the prettiest cactuses, the uh, purple torch or glazed uh, cactus, a kind of Cirrus rickenbachia. It grows in limestone again. This is just west of Pueblo. Most of Pueblo County is limestone with the southern half. And it gives you a good habitat. That's a whole limestone solid uh, butte. And down here, it's mostly it's a mixture of clay and limestone. This is this was blooming in early June. Usually they bloom earlier than this, but we had a really late freeze this year. We, I took these pictures. This is out in the farther eastern Colorado, the Comanche National Grasslands. You see this ridge up here, that's all limestone. But then farther down here, this is more of a mix of limestone and uh, clay. And in a wet year, there's this thing is full of wildflowers. I don't know what's blooming now, it's princess plumes. Another spot growing, this is completely solid limestone here. The plants here are really small because it's just so dry. And in fact, there's a picture, this is taken the same day as the uh, other one on the, in Pueblo County. And you see the actual stem is all uh, pulled into the ground, but it's still blooming. And this is a different variety. I've found one couple weird flowered plants. These are all blooming on the same day. And this, if you notice, this plant is not growing in limestone. It's growing in uh, river rock, uh, right next to a limestone area. This is along the Arkansas River. And uh, this, this river rock was deposited thousands of years ago. The plants growing in the river rock tend to be bigger, like uh, three or four times bigger. This plant is about eight inches tall. And here's the picture, here's that flower there. And I found one with really short tip tepals. Fruits are kind of a 
dull red. Again, growing in the river rock, this is near that other plant. This is about nine inch tall plant. And it's only found in Colorado in the southeast part of the state. All these locations are pretty much uh, limestone. The gap right here, because this is like a high, there's some high mesas and it's, there's just no limestone and it's a little colder there. And here's the range of uh, flora of North America. There's several described right, like over here, sort of the Bailey Eye. It's found over there by Roswell in New Mexico. Yeah, well. this, oh, this whole area down here in New Mexico. It's, it's more widespread than that, all the way even up here. Oh, faster. Okay. Uh, how long? Uh, here's the yellow, yellow flowering, uh, kind of another kind of cirrus, uh, Vered Floris. Yellow flowers. Common name is hen and chicks. This is the hen, and these are the chicks. Uh, it can get multi stemmed. These get higher elevations. This is found up as high as, uh, almost as high as uh, uh, Peter Cactus Simpsoni. The higher elevation forms are smaller, but they get more stems. You get a green, like a pea fruit. Those have real lemony, citrus smelling flowers. Um, uh, quite often it has, uh, it's called the rainbow cactus. It has yellow and red spines. Um, generally, they only have a few central spines, but where they get good moisture farther south, this is in Baca County, they uh, can have all aerials with long centrals like this plant here. This has all yellow spines, it's kind of rare, but only has a few centrals. And it's found across the whole Eastern part of the state, usually on, usually on hills over, overlooking creeks. And we need to go back one. And it's found from the Black Hills all the way down into Mexico, usually on the mountains down here. There's several described subspecies, which are debatable. This is the state flower, state cactus of Colorado, the kind of serious trigocadiates, the clericup. There's three species of clericups in Colorado. Some phantom canyon, it's growing in uh, uh, Pikes Peak uh, granite. Yeah, thanks. This is in uh, early May, very early May. The so trigocadiates means three spines, but you rarely see them with three spines. This is a one in winter, it's all shriveled up. You see three spines. Per area. That one has one. But typically, they have five or six. There's a nice picture showing the uh, flowers erupt above the aerials. There's a variety called gonacanthus, which has super long spines, and it's nothing more than a form. You can find gonacanthus next to regular. You know, they get uh, red flowers that uh, um, they open for. Uh, three to five days. They stay open. All, they don't close at night. Uh, the fruits. Fruits are also edible, just like the fenderize. Um, this is one growing, and this is in the Royal Gorge. This is me taking a picture of it. My wife took a picture without me knowing it. Uh, and again, here's a. This is in the Arkansas River Canyon. Again, right neck growing right next to the road. There's one. This is there's an Escobaria vivipara. Uh, prickly pears. Uh, this is near the, the sign says Wellsville. I wonder where it's at. And my wife Lynn wants me to say that this is not our minivan. <laughs> we do not own a minivan. And the range of it, it goes all the way up here to uh, Buena Vista, Colorado. It's found on the eastern side of the state. And then it crawls up from New Mexico into the uh, area of the Animas River. This one over here is a, a the Mojave uh, mound cactus, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, here's the range of it right here. Follow all the way down here to White Sands, New Mexico, where there's a large uh, form. This is the Mojave. Um, you want to take over? Sure, I can. This is is a, yeah, go ahead. Take over. Uh, this is a kind of serious Mojaveensis. Um, also called the King's Cup cactus, the Mojave mound cactus. Uh, but clearly, we're not in the Mojave right here. Um, it's got the largest range of all the claret cup species, slightly bigger than coccinius per square mile. Uh, but it, in Colorado, it, it's found on the western slope. Uh, this is near Grand Junction. Uh, this is the same area where the sclerocactus glaucus is found. Um, even though this badland area here, these cactus seem quite happy here. And uh, the calicortis nuttleye, which is the state flower of Utah, 
is blooming in this area. And uh, yeah, this plant doesn't seem to be type specific on uh, soil and soil. Uh, if you see in the Mojave, it's found in dolomite, limestone, granite. And here, this is uh, cryptobiological soil on top of uh, Chinle um, sandstone, I believe. Here it is in another sandstone type region. Um, it's also found at um, Black Canyon of the Gunnison. Um, this area is, uh, well, it's a national, mo it's a national monument, right? That's national. Oh, it's a national park now. Uh, there's, this is just one of those highlighted places to see on the Western slope. Uh, plants are pretty common around the canyon edges and in the canyon. Um, what makes this plant different than the other plant is it generally, or Trigochidiaeus, is it generally has the yellow centers, pink pollen, and it also has a rougher, a rougher spine. It has trichomes on the spine. Oh, that's right. It has rounds. And it has, it's similar to Trigochidiaeus, but um, still a different species. Um, as we show in the map here, it's found, it's the red dots on the western slope. There is a, oh, here's the, here's the uh, uh, Flora North America version. Uh, with this, there's a form called Anermis, uh, which is only found right on the Colorado Utah border um, in Mesa County and then also on the adjacent county in Utah. Um, one of the most highly desired species just because it doesn't have spines or it's mostly spineless, we'll say. It was, an species. Uh, it was once an endangered species, but now uh, it generally is spineless when it's in in heavy shade. This uh, this this plant had to clearly been in the shade, but its tree has uh, died. There's a sclerocactus parviflorus in the background with it as well. Um, this is to give you an example of uh, what a prime specimen really looks like. Uh, fruit are the same as the other Mojaveensis. They have a reddish fruit no, no, uh, and uh, no, hardly any spines on the fruit. You can see here that this is a range of, of spines on this plant. This main aerial right here is pretty much spineless. And then you have all these smaller pieces, small, yeah, smaller spines. So don't be upset if your plant has a little bit of spines. Um, Conoceros coccinius. Um, this is a really widespread species. Um, you want to talk about coccinius? Yeah. I'll let him talk about coccinius. Uh, very similar looking to the other clericups, but this one is a tetrapoid. It has uh, four times the number of chromosomes, and it also has separate sex plants. There's my wife taking a picture of that plant. This is in the Royal Gorge, another touristy area, growing in a narrow canyon in Arkansas. There's a Female plants that have the flowers, uh, they only they do only set pollen, they don't produce any pollen. And there's male plants that produce pollen. Um, damn it, not too far. Here's a cross section of a plant of flowers. Female flowers, you can see the stigma, the male. Hardly any anthers. They don't produce any pollen. They have a, and both have nectar chambers. Chambers. Uh, pear cups are all mainly pollinated by hummingbirds. They have this filament barrier that keeps bees from accessing the nectar. Bees will go to these flowers, but they'll still strip away the pollen within within a few hours when they open up. Uh, also, uh, cox, coccinius has pink pollen, but a lot of plants will have yellow pollen that the other clear cups don't have. It tends to form bigger mounds of more tightly packed stem compared to the others. And this is this is a place in Warfano County showing a whole population. There's a super big plant. There's a dead plant. There's small three, four stem plants. The female plants actually are probably the larger plants. When we were looking at it more recently, females seem to be larger plants than male plants. It could just happen to be that way, but I'm assuming it's a generalized thing. And they like to grow also in salt, mostly in solid rock. There's one growing under pinion juniper area, pinion, and it's growing under leaf litter that's collected there. Very large plant. 
It's a backspace again. Uh, this is an unusual spot for this is out towards the plains. You see the mountains in the background. This is like a sandy clay area and there's big, huge plants. I've only seen this. This is like how they grow farther down in New Mexico. We're not far. This is only about 60 miles from New Mexico. And here's the rain. Here's that spot was right there. This county right here, Warfano County, they're super common, super abundant, really. And here's the range, barely into Southern Colorado and it goes all the way, first goes down into, into Mexico. Very common in New Mexico. And now we're gonna do prickly pears. Uh, this is uh, a Puntia polycanta and Donnie's will take over for this part. Nope, the, uh, the dreaded Opuntia, as most people would say, most people just consider this plant a weed in their yard. And a lot of people consider Opuntia's weeds in general. In our state, yeah. Uh, in, in general, uh, Opuntia's are kind of like a religion. You either, uh, you either believe in them or you don't. And everyone has their opinion about it. And there are different sects of people who have their views and different views. And it doesn't seem to matter how much uh, scientific work you've done, there will always be the mm -hmm. hobbyist that tells you you're wrong. Even if you had just finished your uh, PhD thesis on it, happens regularly to me on uh, the internet about study of Opuntia. So Opuntia polycantha, called star, sometimes called uh, um, starving cactus, uh, it, it's really real, it's probably the most dominant species of plant in on I in my county here of Pueblo. Uh, they come in every flavor, going from pinks to yellows and oranges and peaches and everything in between. Uh, I could only imagine if you had to drive a wagon through some of these areas, you would just have to avoid huge patches of this prickly pear. Um, here's a yellow form. Uh, it, so this plant is, has dry fruit. It's not an edible fruit, hence it called starving, cat, starving cactus, different things like that. It's really reliant on pack rats for uh, seed dispersal. And uh, so I'll get to this one here in a second. Trichophora. Well, so we have Opuntia polycantha and then we have another variety, Hystrocina. And hold on a second, grab the, the uh, we, have a, we have this small little neotypic form called uh, Hecake. Hecake is named after Marianne Hecock. This plant gets these long uh, running rhizomes. This plant slowly, becoming its own species or own subspecies. Sometimes people get this one and they'll call it Shearwiniana, but uh, Hecake, I believe, would have priority over that. Um, give you an idea, here's the flowers. On the left is regular polycantha, on the right is the Hecake. Uh, Hecake generally just has yellow flowers. And regular polycantha here will have oranges, purples, and that. And here's the dry fruit. Um, for the most part, it's found everywhere in the state. Um, the western slope plants, I may argue, are this variety Histrocina. Um, here's the overall range of polyacantha. Uh, Flora North America is a lot more conservative on some of the range. It's found in southern Arizona in a few spots and southern New Mexico. Now, variety Histrocina, uh, which a lot of people for some reason don't. Um, except sometimes they lump it under Nikolai or Trichophora as that spiny plant you saw before. Let me show you that one real quick. So Trichophora is nothing but a very spiny, hairy version of Histrocina. In fact, uh, the type locality for Trichophora is this volcanic rocky slope south in Santa Fe called La Bajada. And uh, it was found the same day as Histrocina and was even described in the same uh, publication as Histrocina. However, Histrocina comes in the text first before Trichophora, so it would have priority. Um, Histrocina is the most dominant plant in the Colorado Plateau. Um, it gets much larger flowers than polyacantha, than typical polyacantha. Um, it's closer to Opuntia arenaceae than it is regular polyacantha, 
and that they have a large pericarpal and huge flowers. Um, this is probably this plant right here probably has the largest flowers of any of the cactus in the state. Uh, they can be almost six inches across. Um, in the western slope, they tend to have they can have black spines as well. This may actually have some hybrid um, genetics in it. Imagine that Alcuntias that hybridize. Um, so here, here it is on the same Badlands area with the, there's uh, Aaron, or there's um, Sclerocactus glaucus and uh, um, Iconocerus mojaviensis here as well. Here's the Hystrocena range. Um, and here's kind of their overall range. I'm not quite sure the dot in California on the below Nevada at the tip down there. Somebody must have seen one somewhere. Uh, Puntia fragilis. Uh, this is the most cold hardy cactus in North America. Uh, it's found in Canada. Um, the common name is the brittle cactus. Uh, probably was once way more common when we had bison roaming and no fences. Um, either the wolves or the bison would collect this species and track it across the plains. It was also much cooler then than it is now. This plant doesn't seem to like high temperatures and it seems to be mostly restricted to higher elevations now. Um, this is probably a hybrid, but or it's a second day flower, it's faded to a pink. This is on near Chimney Rock in the southwest portion of the state. Uh, to give you an idea, um, it's real common in the mountainous areas and in the southwest portion. Probably all these spots out here on the plains are probably um, not there anymore or they're just hanging on. Uh, if you can imagine, this was a huge plain once that had, you know, millions of bison on it and gray wolves and everything else that hunted bison that would collect cactus as they ran or moved and migrated. Here's the overall range of fragilis. Um, actually, fragilis comes farther down here into New Mexico as well. I've seen it here. So on the Western Slope, there are all these super colorful plants and they're kind of halfway between a fragilis and a um, polyacantha. And there was always these two names associated with it, Opuntia rutilla and Opuntia debrisii. Well, debrisii, as we mentioned in the book, was cultivated by Marianne Hickok and given to a foreigner overseas and was a garden plant. And it doesn't quite fit well within coloradensis and just kind of looks more synonymous with regular fragilis. Um, Opuntia, uh, Opuntia rutilla is not a described name whatsoever. So we took it upon us to uh, clear this up a little more and name this Opuntia ex coloradensis. Um, it is a cross between Opuntia hystrocina and Opuntia fragilis. Um, Plants get one flower per pad, like a fragilis, and they sprawl out like fragilis, but they have, they don't, they don't, yeah, they're, they get large flowers and they don't break off easily like fragilis. They come in uh, several different colors. They really have these darkened purple aerials and uh, plants can be a hexaploid or pentaploid. Um, it's probably one of the easier cactus species to grow. Um, it's, I don't know, it, it's not the friendliest plant, but it, it's interesting. Here's the dark and purple aerials to show. Uh, more examples of them. There's a, like a lesser version and a large, there's a lesser version and like a, a greater version. Sometimes you would hear those plants called rutilla and super rutilla, if anyone's ever seen these in horticulture for sale. Uh, give you an idea of the range of their what they look like. There's some very large plant, very large pads and small pads, and they also get these small dry fruits, just like Fred, Fragilis. Um, a pink plant with white edges. I'll just give you an idea of the flower colors here. And it's found only on the western slope here. It's found also in the uh, 
in Utah on the opposite side there goes all the way almost to uh, um, Salina, Utah. Now, Apuntia macrorhiza, um, macrorhiza, because it has a tuberous root, it's uh, generally a hybrid in our area. If it's a prickly pear and it gets juicy fruits, there's a strong chance it's a hybrid. Um, that goes for your area of Long Beach too with the Opuntia littoralis and Engelman eye and uh, maybe some Phaecantha and Opuntia vaceae. But macrorhiza here gets these, uh, if I can, is mostly, is mostly spineless except for the top portion here. Gets these long flower tubes. It's a yellow flower, usually with a orange red center. Um, this plant's probably got some polycanth in it, which would make it more tortoise spina. Then this is definitely a hybrid with the pink flowers because this plant should only have yellow flowers. Um, here's, the, here's the fruit that laying down. It gets real wrinkly in wintertime. Um, this plant generally is extremely sprawling and um, most of the year you can kind of just find it holding on. Um, these yellow fruit here have some kind of uh, fly or wasp or some insect in them, but it happens quite a bit here. We'll, you'll see these yellow fruit. And here's uh, why it's called macrorhiza. It's got the, these weird tuber, almost sweet potato-like roots. And uh, it's got quite a large range. Here's kind of the overall range. Uh, the whole, the whole uh, section of New Mexico should be blocked in and most of West Texas. And it goes all the way up there to South Dakota. So this is a plant that they commonly call Opuntia phaeacantha, but in some reason, uh, a uh, plant botanist in our area is so stubborn he won't uh, recognize as another species called Opuntia tortospina. This is a cross between the macrorhiza you just saw and Opuntia polycantha, which is found everywhere here. And one's, well, one can be a diploid and one can be a tetraploid and they can both be tetraploids. And so sometimes you get auto hexaploid, so 66 chromosomes. And you can get these real big monstrous plants that have brown spines, just like Opuntia phaeacantha. The trouble is Opuntia phaeacantha tends to be a hybrid everywhere as well. But Opuntia tortospina is probably the most dominant brown spine prickly pear <clears throat> in the plains areas and in the foothills in Colorado and New Mexico and Texas. Um, it can get quite big. In fact, it can be three to four feet tall in places where they get the moisture. It also gets a yellow flower with a red center, like most of the yellow flower and or fleshy fruited prickly pears gets red edible fruits. But I wanted to show here that, um, that the tortoise spinas, um, you know, how, how do you say that one plant is a Puntia polycantha and one is macrorhiza and they can cross back and forth? A lot of people use the name of Puntia simochilla and simochilla fits within the series of crosses between these. Um, so Simochilla, in my opinion, is just a synonymy with tortospina. Um, tortospina means twisted spines, but both these species normally have twist, can have twisted spines. So it's a poor feature. And um, tortospina would have priority over Simochilla anyhow in the naming process. Um, we don't have that many dots on here because a lot of there's private land and that, and just haven't haven't gotten back and re-added dots, but it, it's found pretty much everywhere out here on the out here on the uh, plains. And the western slope plants are probably going to be a different species once I'm done with the New Mexico book. Um, give you an idea of tortoise spinas range. This is the other hybrid from the western slope, Macrorhiza and Histrocina. It's way spinier than the tortoise spina of the western slope. Uh, it can have yellow flowers or red flowers because it's a cross with the um, a dry fruited prickly pear, which can have any color flowers. And Apuntia phaeacantha, um, it's uh, I hate to say that it's it's the bastard child of uh, hybridization. Uh, 
it, it's found throughout most of the Southwest. It's super common and everyone in, who's ever looked at plants, if it's got brown spines, its name is Opuntia phaeacantha. Uh, this is actually my main focus of study for prickly pear. Um, so I have been discouraged by every botanist in the Southwest uh, and uh, any person in horticulture to tell me that I can do something better with my time. Uh, everyone has an opinion on what's a Puntia phaeacantha and uh, visiting the type locality many times I've come to the decision that it is a hybrid and uh, a whole revision of this group need, is needed and I'm working on it. Um, this is one of the rangers at Chimney Rock uh, National Monument. He was showing us some of the prickly pears at one of the pit houses right by this dead tree at the top here. There's a there's a pit house right behind that and there's a pit house right to the right and there's these large prickly pear uh, phaeacantha hybrids there that are out of place because this is above 7,000 feet. Um, this is also definitely a hybrid with phaeacantha if it's got the if it's got these large tufts of glockids it's a hybrid this would be a macrorhiza hybrid this is one of the most common uh, forms of phaeacantha um, that you'll find and in most of the things they show it the range of tortoise spina as it's found all through Colorado but really it's only found along the edges it comes up the Colorado River drainage it's found over here in the Four Corners area the San Juan area and then it's found down here in Black Mesa where it's lower elevation and you get influence from Oklahoma and Texas and that's kind of an overdone map and for some reason they don't show Fayacantha in southern Arizona where there's thousands of species I mean, thousands of specimens. Um, to give you an idea of tortoise spina versus um, phaeacantha, the tortoise spina is a larger padded plant and phaeacantha and its hybrids are smaller. Um, this kind of shows you the flower dissects. Uh, for identifying prickly pears, um, there's never really a great answer for it. It's going to have to do with the, the way of flower dissects. And then you have to look at like whole populations. You can't just look at like one individual because I, I don't know how many times I've talked places and someone will bring you that one prickly pear. Here, can you tell me what this is? Well, it just came out of your garden. It's plump, it's green, it's got brown spines and there's a red fruit on the top of it. What color was the flower? Yellow. Uh, well, it's not growing in its natural condition. So it's going to be pretty hard to to work on. And uh, here's a uh, pack rat in, in right at home with uh, prickly pears. And uh, we always like to end the thing with animals live in a plant matrix. And um, if anyone's really interested in reading more up on Colorado cactus, you can go to coloradocacti.com. It'll take you to a link for Amazon. Um, books, you can buy it there. And then also I grow lots of these cactus and succulents, a lot of South African succulents at my ethical desert nursery. Uh, I use coconut core for my main base, we try to do everything as ethical as we possibly can. Um, and that would be the end of our presentation. Do you have any questions? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Donnie. Yeah, we'll get questions. Anybody have any questions now? Just, uh, you're probably all muted, so unmute yourself. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Uh, something you, uh, the last thing you said kind of struck me and you could you uh, not share? Did you turn off the screen sharing? Oh, yeah. Okay, so what, what struck me was you said uh, you, you can grow your cactus plants in cocoa core, is yeah. it? Do you use pure or do you use pumice or? Yeah, I, I use um, I I use about it's it's five parts coconut core, five parts or five parts compost, which is made from a peat uh, like old nursery stuff, which is peat moss basically, and then I use uh, red volcanic rock and perlite, and uh, 
that the, the perlite is mined like real close to us so we can get it real easy. A lot of people are anti perlite, but uh, it's one of the cheapest products for me to use in my area. So um, it makes more sense to use it than some of the other things. You'll probably be you are changing out your soil anyway because of the peat moss and stuff like that, how it breaks down. So you'll, you'll, you'll uh, be changing it enough where the pumice won't be a problem with breakdown and all that, right? Yeah, I, I try to get these plants after, they gotta be out of here in two years or else I'm not doing a good enough job selling plants. Um, the coconut core doesn't break down like the other stuff. And I, the, I'm using, the compost is made from, from you know, people dumping uh, uh, old pots and stuff like that. So there is topsoil and other stuff that gets put in it. So it's more than just peat moss in it. It's just old nursery stock being dumped in there too. So it's got to go somewhere. Might as well use it. For us, uh, the religion down here is uh, cactus and peat moss don't mix, but I'm glad you said that. That's that's why I asked you about it because it's kind of, you know, it kind of uh, relieves me a little bit because I know peat moss is great for growing stuff, but they said don't ever use it on cactus and you just kind of shot that down. So I'm glad, I'm glad you did. Well, it, it, uh, it, it's got like a huge, uh, it's got a huge um, footprint for peat moss in general. It, right. It's like, it, it's like worse than some of the oil products just by how much energy it takes to get you peat moss. Uh, and then it's not, it doesn't uh, renew so easily. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad we were actually able to uh, talk finally there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? I want to monopolize this. Great I'm photos, Tony. Really good stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So pretty much all of the stuff you have in there is, uh, it won't be affected by snow? No. Uh, snow snow falls in all in all areas of the of our uh, state state are you talking about are you talking about nursery stock stuff no no um, your your well your nursery stock um, specific to the plants that you were just talking about yeah the, the, the Colorado cactus stuff no none of it will be affected by snow um, yeah, well, if you get like huge amounts of snow, the Cylindro punti ambricata may have some problems. We uh, we figured that that's why it's only found a little bit farther north than here is because once they get to about Colorado Springs, they can get like three or four feet of snow where we get snow. I think the I, the other day I mentioned the, the highest amount of snowfall I've ever seen was 11 inches of snow here. We rarely get like, I mean, we, we get dusting to three to five inches of snow at any time and it's gone later that day so I could imagine if you lived in Minnesota or something like that you probably wouldn't have too much hope for imbricata just because it would take wouldn't take the weight big problem for you guys there in Long Beach right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the biggest problem we have down here is ash from the wildfire that's about it <laughs> We have, we get your ash too. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. You're not, here too. And we have our own fires too. But for some reason, every time you guys get fires that way, the, the air goes up to Canada and comes right down the front range to us too. So wow. we get your, we get your air pollution too on occasion. Sorry about that. <laughs> you're, you're not exclusive in that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. If nobody has any questions, I'd like to thank both you and your dad uh, for this presentation. It was very good. Uh, photography was magnificent. It was very good. I learned a lot. And um, wow, if I have any questions or if anybody asks me questions later, I will shoot you guys emails. And, okay. the, and then uh, you can answer like that. Sometimes the questions don't come up right away. And then later on, somebody will think of something. So, uh, so we'll, we'll work it out like that. Okay, Donnie? All right, sounds good. I found, right. I found it really interesting the part where you tied it in the uh, with the uh, the Anastasi ruin site. So that, that was very interesting. 
So those and, are primarily Apuntia hybrids, you say, that are there that are that are sterile. Uh, yeah. So it's a it's a male sterile plant. Um, I've done several stainings. Uh, I've used uh, lectophenyl cotton blue to stain the pollen to see if it's viable, because they do produce a little bit of pollen, but it's always um, probably like one grain per per thousand grains might have some viability to it but it doesn't seem to pollinate anything else in the wild they definitely don't have any uh they don't ever produce any fruit uh, about a hundred yards away from one of the populations there's a cylindra puntia whippoli and i mean i could see a bee going from there to there but it, it still doesn't seem to produce any fruit in the wild in our garden though we've found fruit off of the plants but we have imbricata Growing right there and in the wild there is no imbricata anymore it's hybridized itself out to become anasaziensis mm. um, but at the other locations you can find the same pink hybrid there's there's actually very little variability in the like the 12 locations that it's found um, and, and i'm not quite clear is are you are you implying that these were cultivated by the indians and in, in yes the well so what we're guessing is that they took the Cylindra puntia imbricata to cultivate. Well, Whippoli is found there. So when they planted imbricata, okay. you know, in, in uh, 800 or 850 CE, uh, they planted imbricata. And well, it's now 2000, it's 2020 CE. And that amount of time, uh, Whippoli crossed imbricata and eliminated imbricata. And you have this now Anasazi choya. Interesting. Three places actually. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the one population where the type locality is it, it it's just being reproduced uh, um, just by cuttings and stuff like that. In fact, we noticed the elk use that area a ton. So I'm guessing they kick the crap out of the plants in the wintertime and they just lay there till the snow melts and then repopulate this hillside because it's where the type of quality for the plant is, there's the most plants yeah, there. Yeah, it's it's real dense worth of plants. So between man and nature, that made a made this hybrid. Very interesting. It is. Well, I mean, okay. uh, in general, uh, apuntias and all this stuff is used majorly by the Native Americans. Well, I mean, you, you didn't have a. Uh, you didn't have all the commodities we had for, for food. And they, I guess the, you can buy from like that native seed search place, the dried, or the semi-dried uh, flower buds to eat, choya buds. And, and uh, you know, they make prickly pear jelly and all that stuff out of it. So well, if you didn't have, um, you know, raspberries at your disposal, you know, what do you got? Well, I got all these prickly pears that produce these red fruits and they got these flowers I can eat. And it's, it's a, crappy year i guess i'm going to eat some some cactus pieces right so how it's you know one of the most useful useful uh uh cactus or cactus are one of the most useful plants especially when you ain't got that many plants so yeah i'm not so sure it had to be a crappy year it might have just been a normal year that they were eating the cacti you know that the anasazi were interesting people they uh they had turkeys for pets and then later on they ate ate turkeys but for the most part they had pet turkeys like their dogs nothing like having a little pet turkey maybe he ate the prickly pears too that they cultivated in the choyas or who knows maybe they just like the flower color i like i traded this guy down there an aztec guy down the road he had this nice purple flowered choya i'm gonna plant this right near my hut this year and suddenly oh it grows real nice and now i got 50 of them and my buddy wants a piece over there. So yeah. there is no cactus collectors. Yeah, well, I mean, they could have just been cactus collectors too. Think about the all the agaves they ate in southern New Mexico and I mean southern Arizona and Mexico. So how much of that was for leisure? Ain't got TV, you gotta do stuff. Just like you're the kid out there drawing drawing petroglyphs on the wall. Right. I mean, most of that stuff was done by kids, all the petroglyphs on rock walls. Got to be doing some some stuff, you know. Got to got to keep yourself busy. Not like you were spending the whole day hunting deer and that stuff. Got to have some downtime as humans. So that's always interesting stuff to me. Yeah. 
All right. Thanks, Donnie. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dad. We're going to move to the next part of the meeting, and which is going to be Chris Boca. If you'd like to stick around, you can. We're going to do our plant of the month. And uh, we, what we do is we send uh, uh, photos of the plant, whatever the plant is, to Chris. Uh, Chris puts it on Facebook. And people vote on each plant. And then and Chris talks about the winners. So that's what we're going to go. So you got, you're welcome to... Uh, you know, go on with your, go have lunch or something. But uh, if you'd like to stick around, you're welcome. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Donnie. That was a lot of awesome information on some cacti that we don't always uh, pay attention to because we're out here in California. Um, yeah. We're close to Mojave, and so we don't always see what's out there in Colorado. So that was really cool. Uh, for our show this month, let me get the uh, screen going there. We had for our plants of the month were our cacti were Matacana and Copiapoa. Uh, our succulent was Crashula this month. Um, and so we'll start off with the, uh, let's get this going on here. The beginner division. Um, on the Copiapoa side cacti, uh, those were our entries this month, a little light. Um, it'd be awesome to have more next month. We have uh, Gymnocleseum, so hopefully we can get, get everybody try to get some uh, shots in. I know people have these uh, plants, so it'd be awesome to have more participation. Um, let's see, if we get to the succulents, we have a little bit more. Uh, click on over. Next slide. Boom. Um, and so those are the succulents for the beginners. On the intermediate division, we had some great participation. Cacti, some pretty cool ones. Uh, all Copiapoa represented so far. Uh, and on the succulent side, our intermediates. And the advanced division, yes, once again, the Maria Capaldo division, ladies and gentlemen, our cacti. And our succulents for the Maria Capaldo division. Some awesome ones submitted. And our winners this month. Uh, by default, I'll take the sweep. <laughs> Thank you for voting. Um, so first is the Esmeraldana, second, my little baby Cinerea, and the Montana came in third this month. Uh, uh, on the Crashula side, this was a Kelly Eddy sweep. Kelly Eddy taking all of them from her purple light to the pubescens to the group estrus. I really like the pubescens mm. personally. That was really cool. Well staged. Uh, definitely some competition on the intermediate side of things. Uh, Alden took first place with his Hasseltoniana. Uh, Richard's uh, Humilis V Tenuissima uh, will take second place. And Kathy's Bridges EI takes third. All of those very well presented, awesome specimen. I, I love the uh, segmented piecing there on the on Richards as well. It's really cool. And for the uh, Crashula in the intermediate division, uh, Richard is going to go ahead and do the Salcedo sweep this month. Boom, first, second, third. Uh, he's going to take it with the first with the Dorothy. Um, yeah, flowers win. They just tend to do that. Love the inflorescence on that. Well staged as well. Uh, his Ovada Gollum uh, shows that you can take a rather, uh, I could say, plain plant and do something awesome with it. Uh, that looks really cool. And uh, the Moon Glow uh, stacking up for third. And on to the advanced Maria Capaldo division, of course the Matacana has to win. It's the only different one on the cacti side. And it's got... <laughs> uh, Craziana coming in second and the Hypogea coming in third. Uh, and um, on the uh, succulent side, this is what received votes. So we only have a first and a second this month uh, for... Okay, I'm gonna really just butcher this the mesembryanth mesembryanthemoides yes <laughs> good okay 
uh, <laughs> flowers win. That's the way it works. And then the elegance taking second. So very, very well done. Thank you, Maria, for uh, everything that you submitted. It was <laughs> awesome um, to have, have some uh, advanced participation. Next month, though, mini show, March. It's uh, Genocolisium or our cactus, uh, and succulent is a Aeonium. So I know that these are definitely something that everyone has in their uh, repertoire. So hopefully we can see uh, everyone out for March and see what you got and uh, yeah, have some more com fun competition for next month. And thank you everyone who did participate this month. That was a yeah, good showing. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, no, thank you guys. All right. All right, that was awesome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who participated. We lost a lot of people there. The, oh, we still have 15. Um, so um, that was cool. Cool presentation. Cool plan of the month. Um, so um, the, the board and I, last year, end of last year, we're trying to figure out how to do a plant sale, right? And uh, it was kind of difficult because we tried, wanted to try to reach as many people as we could. Um, if we do Instagram, you know, probably 80% of our membership um, wouldn't be able to bid. Um, if we do Zoom, probably 40% uh, wouldn't be able to bid. You know, and so it, there's, and I, I kind of, I'm thinking that it doesn't really matter where we, what platform we use, we're not everybody is going to be able to, to do it. So um, the way that uh, Conejo Cactus Club did was they did it just at a Zoom meeting. And uh, they made some pretty good money um, and it was successful, people had fun. They had the rules all spelled out. Um, so I think, you know, we might be able to do something like that. That way it's live. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, people can bid by commenting, not by saying, you know, I'll bid this, I'll bid that, they'll just comment. So nobody will be missed. I think that's a good idea. I don't know. Um, if somebody else has another idea that they think might work better. I know Instagram works really well for that kind of stuff. But, but because of our demographic, you know, we, I wanna have, it would be nice to raise a lot of money for the club, but it would be nice for a lot of people in the club to be able to participate. You know, so that's kind of a tough one because we can make we can make a bundle of money on Instagram, you know, because we have a, a much bigger audience there and people are willing to buy and people know the club. But uh, but that would exclude a lot of our membership. So I'm thinking about um, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm open for ideas. I'm not telling you we're going to do this. I'm just kind of throwing this out to the club, you know, because uh, right now we there's, you know, 12 of us out here better than just, <laughs> you know. Well, James, is is the goal to make money for the club, in which case, you know, doesn't matter whether members can buy or not, or is the goal to have members be involved in buying plants for themselves. So I think that's the key. And if right. it's that's the first goal, then, you know, Instagram is probably the best. And if it's the second goal, then obviously a different format needs to be done. Yeah, I, I would like to do, my goal is to have the plants available to the membership. But, and, and the money secondary. But even if we do Zoom. Yeah, you know, it does eliminate it, a lot of people. But yeah, but even if we do Zoom, it's still a lot of people don't do Zoom. If we do mm -hmm. Instagram, I'm, I'm talking about in the club. Yeah. So, but if we do Instagram, probably even less people do Instagram than do Zoom. You know, so if, so, I'll put it out there to the membership. I'll put it out there to you guys. What is the goal? Is the goal for us to make money or to provide um, a place where the, uh, the membership can buy new plants? I mean, nice plants, you know, other than what they can buy at maybe a, a pop-up somewhere. You know, somebody will put up some nice plants. We have, we have a lot of nice plants available. 
but uh, you know, so I'd like to put it out there to you guys. I, you know, I I will make sure it gets done. However, the membership feels um, it would serve the membership. You know, if serving the membership means making money for the club, or serving the membership means have more plants available to the membership. You know, and that's exactly my point, Maria. That's a, that's a tough one. And I'd like, that's why I'm asking for the help because I, I don't I think, want... I think you should, there's so few people now that maybe you should email people and see if you get a response with a vote. Are you interested in buying plants and us having a sale for you? Or do you just want to raise money for the club? Or, you know, uh, and you don't care about buying plants and, and that might get more people involved. Are you talking sale or auction? An auction. Yeah, you can make, I think you can make much more in an auction than you can in the sale. You know, too bad we can't serve liquor because <laughs> that always bumps it up a little bit. You mean people always bid more when they're drinking? Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> I know when I used to drink, I did. I don't drink anymore, but yeah, it's just kind of makes you like uh, have a little bit of fun. <laughs> Do you bid more when you're drinking? <laughs> We're talking about an auction. When you get down to the <laughs> last minute. I've never done one. Right. When you get down to the last minute, how many people are going to sign when you have to do it one at a time online to get that last bid in, that could be a free for all. Well, free for all is good, <laughs> right? A lot of people are bidding on a plant. Is that what you mean? I don't know what you mean. You know, people hang around the table when it gets to the last minute. They want to be the last one to write their, write their bid. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I guess this wouldn't be silent auction. This is a live auction you're talking. We're yeah, either if we do it Instagram or if we do it on the Zoom, it would be a live auction. And I would say in order to, uh, if, if we probably want to profit the most, you know, we want to reach the most people or we want to, whatever we decide or profit the most, um, a good way to do it, I think, is like the last bid and maybe like 10 seconds after the last bid, you know, we won't say ready, one, two, and then close and close it on somebody right when they're gonna bid. So maybe 10 seconds after the last bid, if there's no more bids. If don't, call, you have to, don't you have to do the going, going, gone? <laughs> we can, but we don't have to do it that way. We could do just the highest bid. Don't they just keep getting higher until you cut it off or until nobody bids anymore? No, nobody bids anymore. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, uh, that's one way to do it. That's not the only way to do it. If 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 the uh, club would like me or whoever the auctioneer is, I wouldn't be the auctioneer to give them the countdown and cut it off like that. Then what we could do that. And where do the plants come from? From members who want to members only. Members can have um, can have plants in the auction, but anybody can bid. Yeah, we do a 50-50 split with the do donating member, right? Well, we uh, that's kind of high. Maybe um, because there's not really any expenses involved. You know, we're not buying anything for anybody. We don't have to cover any expenses. So we could do maybe 20% or 30%. I, the usual is about 30% what I've seen. Oh, okay. Uh, but we could even go 20% because we have zero cost to recoup. Well, who gets the 20 and who gets the 80 Oh, the, the, whoever, um, the seller, the, the member gets 80% or 70 or whatever we decide, and the club gets a smaller percentage. I would think what you'd want to do, James, is whatever is going to get the most members involved for fun, because we don't have a lot of expenses. We don't have a great need for money, but to keep people connected and active and interested would be the most important thing, I think. Well, what, what we, I, I think what we'd like to do is at least make $1,200 because that's what it's costing us a year. Um, what, 12 plus whatever the cost of the Zoom subscription, that's what it's costing us a year. 
to put on these webinars or to put on these Zoom meetings. They're hundred dollars a meeting, plus the cost of the Zoom. The Zoom is like you know they, we pay annually, I think, and whatever that is. So we it would be nice to recoup some of that. I, I think uh, I think the Conejo Club uh, made about twelve hundred dollars. So uh, and uh, Linda, she is the president of the Conejo Club. She has offered uh, um, to help us like with any questions we might have. Um, and there's was, a live auction. It was a live auction on a Zoom. Um, but you know, there's a couple of people that aren't actually in the club, but sometimes they come to the meetings uh, that help Gary Duke. Gary Duke has uh, online uh, Instagram um, auctions or sales. I think he has sales, not auctions. Uh, so they have a lot of experience in that end of it. You know, so what, whatever we decide, we can, we can make it happen. I just, I don't want to make anything happen without, um, without the club's input. Do you have an executive committee, or an executive board to help you sort through this stuff? Yeah, we have a board. Yeah, we do have a board. But, uh, you know, it's kind of hard for the board to decide some things. I mean, I mean, not, it's not, I mean, we can vote and we can decide. But, you know, something like this, it's pretty big. And, and we're going to be asking for the club's participation. So we'd like to have the club's input on how they would like it done. You know, so they can be part of it too. The, 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 the board, we can, we can take a vote and we could make it happen, you know, next month. But if, if the club feels like they have some say in it, which they should, because yeah. this is all new territory for everybody. Yeah. I think we'll maybe get some more participation and, and we won't, we'll, we'll, we'll be nice about it. You know, if somebody has a lot of nice plants, like say for instance, there's a guy, uh, his, his name, I don't know his, I know his Instagram name, but I don't remember his real name. I met him, I talked to him, he's a nice guy, but there's a guy named uh, Variegated Troy, right? He has nice plants, he makes pots. Um, I'm sure he would be involved. Uh, there's uh, Tony Marino. Uh, um, he has great plants and I could probably get him involved, but, you know, but they're not club members. So we, we could open up club membership to them and say, Hey, you want to make a couple hundred bucks? Give me 20 bucks, you know, be a part of the club and you could sell up to three plants or whatever we decide. There are people that good resources that I can get a hold of and not just me, you know, there are, um, like, We've uh, got great growers in our club. We do, we do, and you know we'll close it at, at a maximum amount. We'll close it at thirty plants or twenty plants, whatever we decide. So we don't have an all-day auction because at the end we're going to have a thousand-dollar plant sell for twenty dollars because that's all anybody has left. You know. So, uh, Crystal, what do you think? Did you say you just want to say hi? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can't hear her. Maybe speak a little bit louder. Let me see. Can you hear me now? Can you okay. hear me now? No, 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 yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sometimes the headset doesn't connect. Such a pain. But I definitely think that if you use Instagram, you are you will make more money just because there's a lot more novice people on there and you're going to get more traffic um, and higher bids. But I also think you can use Instagram to really market the Zoom link and um, maybe showcase some of the things that are going to be for sale. And if you really market some plants that might be in the auction or are going to be in the auction, um, people will join if you just flood Instagram with posts, you know, people are going to share it through their stories and people are going to send it to other people and they're going to want to join if they see, oh, here's a couple plants that are going to be there. So I think you can use Instagram to your advantage if you did want to do a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Yes, can people be on Instagram all at the same time and talking just like this? Uh, it won't be like this. What you'll be is you'll be on an Instagram photograph, say, of a plant that on the Long Beach Cactus Club account, right? So you'll see a picture of a plant 
and you won't really be able to, um, you'll probably have to do something like, okay, bidding on this stops at four o'clock or two o'clock or whatever. And that, and then, you know, we, people could bid until like four o'clock and then you could turn off commenting or something like that. Um, but, but there could be a thousand people looking at the same picture, but there's no communication like talking. It's going to be more of a, okay, MA just bid a hundred dollars. Do I want to, do I want to bid 110 or do I want to bid, you know, 105 or 101, whatever. So there's no, if you do it on Instagram, there's no talking and communication. If you do it on Zoom, we all feel connected and we can see and hear what's going on. Yeah, but we have, we have a large- about, I'd be concerned about too much advertising beyond our club. Do we wanna grow the club by giving potential vendors, they pay 20 bucks, they join the club, they can vent, they can auction their plants, but they're not really active participants. I would. You don't know that they might become active participants. Well, we got ourselves. This is my perspective, which doesn't mean it's true. I watched us grow from a intimate, happy little family to getting so big we outgrew this beautiful place where we were meeting. And I want to be careful we don't explode so big that we don't maintain a sense of community. Is there any validity to that concern? I, I could understand the, that feeling. That feeling. Um, so the San Gabriel Club, it's, there are a lot of, there's 400 people in a club and there are a lot of communities in that club. They're not necessarily one big community. Like the Long Beach Club, it's starting to get like that too. There's all our communities. And I don't see that harming the, the club too much. Um, in the Los Angeles club, they're kind of a, a bigger one community, you know? Um, and I, I, don't, I don't see any problem with that either. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think having a larger club is okay as long as it's just gonna be more work for those who serve them, you know? But uh, for members, if, you know, the longtime members like you and and Maria and, you know, by that time, Chris, you know, everybody will, will we're gonna be bringing people in and welcoming them instead of saying, okay, you stay in that group and you stay in that group. We're gonna to try to make everybody feel like one group. So you're triggering brainstorming here. We could do an auction every month or every three months. You could do one on Instagram and then you could do them on Zoom. You could have club activity in another arena in addition to the weekly or the monthly Zooms. Yeah, that's a lot of work, <laughs> but we could, we, you know. But how much no work way. is really involved? I don't, I don't understand all that, but. but. Yeah, there has to be tracking, there has to be gathering of plants, there has to be a gathering of money. There ha there's a lot that goes on. That the only thing that we're not gonna have is food and a, a venue, but everything else that, um, involved in an auction we're going to have. We're going to have money. We're going to have uh, like a place to take all the plants. We're, we're going to need, maybe maybe we'll have to get the, the, uh, the women's club. We'll have to rent that uh, for an afternoon so people can come pick up plants. Because I could keep them at my house, but that's a long drive. I'll probably have to pay people for gas. <laughs> so they we could can... just show them from, their, from home where they are. They have to, did Conejo have all their plants in one place? No, well, yeah, we could do that, or we could, everybody could send a central person, whoever that is, photographs of their plants, lots of photographs, maybe we'll have a minimum of three photographs per plant. And if it's in a, if it's in a nice pot, then photographs of the pot too. And, and, um, and then we could, we can do the auction like that or sale like that. And then everybody takes their plants over to the women's club and we'll rent the place for four hours and you know everybody can come and pick up their plants like that. That's where it's closer to you guys. I'm happy to store them here, but it's a long drive for everybody. Where do you live? I live uh, a little bit north of Pasadena. Huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it'll be a drive. Well, how many plants are you talking about, James? If it's only 30 plants, why don't we just kind of play it by ear? Some, some, you know. Half the plants might just be handled by the people locally. That, you know, they might just make arrangements to pick it up from the person they bought it from, or something. We might not have to 
handle all of the plants centrally. Maybe just a small percentage of them will be handled that way. It might work out your, like I'm buying a plant from you and I might just get it from you somehow and I don't have to hook up where they're all being centrally located or whatever. You know, that's, that's a possibility too. That's a, that's a good possibility. I mean, we could work that way too. Yeah, I think every 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 purchase could have its own solution for the purchaser and the and the seller as to how they're going to hook up. Some people might want to come to one drop off place, and some people might live relatively close to the person they're buying it from, and they just might already know them and get it from them. Like if I buy something from Henry, he's right down the street from me. I can just go over there and pick it up in five minutes. Yeah, uh, but you're a lot further away, so that would cause some logistics between the two of us to figure out how we're going to make it happen. But yeah, that's something I'm open to. That's something. Yeah. I'm totally open to whatever you guys, whatever solutions you guys have, because uh, I'll bring more questions than I will solutions. And well, maybe you could just maybe get write it up in a way like if if the purchaser and the seller cannot come to terms on how they're going to make uh, get the plants to each other, that, that on this day we will have a location for the plant to be dropped off at, and the person's expected to come pick it up at that location. But if, if the buyer and seller can't work, I mean, there's, those are just minor details to work out, you know, down the road. Yeah, and, and the 30, is it just a number I just pulled out of the air? Um, yeah. Doesn't mean anything. It could be 20, it could be 50. You know, it's whatever we decide. Well, it's and, a lot more manageable than a plant. So we're talking hundreds and hundreds of plants. And how would those people, how would, you know, then you got to get all the plants that have been bought to all the buyers. And that's that's a whole, that's a much bigger nightmare than something 20, 30, 40 plants. That's a lot more manageable. Yeah. How did Conejo handle the money? Um, I think they all paid Linda. Did they send and, checks? Um, I don't know. I don't think there's any problem with checks either. There shouldn't be any problem with checks. Um, but like, maybe they paid cash. Um, but they weren't know. in person, so. Well, no. When they go to pick out, when they go to pick it up, I think everything went to Linda's house. That's where I got that idea. Everything went to Linda's house, and then they had to arrange with Linda how they were going to pick it up. So that's where I got that from, but that doesn't mean Sorry. they have to. But that's okay. Yeah, we don't we don't have to do it that way. That's just the way they did it. And you know, Scott has a different idea, and maybe that maybe that will be easier for us. I don't know. So that's something we'll have to decide. So maybe I'll I'll put out an email to the club, and I'll say we're going to have a special Zoom meeting about uh, club auction. You know. We need your input. Uh, come to the Zoom meeting February 14th or whatever. You know, maybe maybe Valentine's Day would be a good time to do it because, uh, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of socializing and maybe this will be a good outlet for people. I don't know. Maria and I have a meeting on February 14th. It's perfect. And that's when we'll do it then. With our <laughs> meeting? <laughs> I have to tell you, James, I had been 100% negative on this. And the more you talk about it, the more I think, hmm, maybe Maria and I could do something with South Coast, too. <laughs> this idea its a way to give people an opportunity to maybe get a new plant and yep. to see and each other. That's just a plant they can get over at a pop-up, right? Uh, at, you know, and, and I hate to talk about the last one that just happened yesterday because it was some I didn't mean it. To that specific sale because there was some really nice very expensive plants available at that sale how did uh, they have a good turnout i think they did i only saw some instagram stuff and it looked like they had a good turnout but some of the plants that came out of there oh my gosh they had a euphorbias i forgot what it's called it starts with an a it's kind of rare it's really hard to grow and they had a, they had a few of those for sale you know well, it was uh, so last minute and it was the same time as the cssa webinar so I didn't right. even consider it. I, could, Actually, I it was an hour before I, MA. I went to it and got home right before the. Did you? How was it, Scott? It was a little. One one of the tables was really crowded. I think Botanical Wonders from down south. He had a lot of expensive plants. I mean, he had some plants that were five hundred dollars. He had two or three of those. Yeah. And uh, so I mean, he had a ton of plants. He had some. I can't remember the name of them. They're a big codex that have a vine growing out of them, and he won to five hundred for those. He had smaller ones, he wanted 300 and 200 for. So there was a lot of expensive plants at a couple of those tables. Gary Duke was selling plants like hotcakes in his typical price range of, you know, $3 to $30. And he had a lot of people at his table. 
Um, there were some potters that, you know, there was a lot, there was quite a few people there. It's not a lot of parking there. That's a problem. People were, there's a lot of cars. There's probably many cars driving around looking for parking spots as there were people parked and in the place. Were they so? I, I saw probably 20 or 30 cars in the street looking for parking spots. No joke. Scott, were they socially distanced and wearing masks? Was it all controlled safely? I, I did my part. Some people were very, were, I felt some people were way too close to each other. There was a, a, it was very packed at one of the booths and I just stayed away from it. You know? yeah, I think probably everybody, everybody that I saw was wearing masks. Oh yeah, everyone had a mask on. There was no problem with masks. Yeah, but yeah. just, I don't know if, the only way you can control the crowds is to, you know, limit the amount of people that are in. That's right. When, Pe when Petra had her, she would have appointments. You went to that one, James. Yeah, appointments. And I think that's a really good way to have a sale is that you can control how many people are on the property at any time. And yeah, and, but that really cuts back on the amount of people, the amount of the sales you make. So, you know, I, I'm glad we don't, we're not having, we're talking, we're not talking about in-person sale. We're definitely talking about a safe online sale, no contact, you know, that whole type of thing. Yeah, I, I don't know how much that will cut back, James. I know it's going to cut back some, but part of Petra's, you know, to begin with, is she's so far down there to begin with. So, yeah. so she didn't fill every time slot. And I think up here that if we had time, we would fill every time slot up in this area. There's that many people that we wouldn't have any problem filling every slot. She had, I went on and looked and she had like hours that had nobody scheduled to come at all, like for a couple of days, like the one to two o'clock, not one person scheduled. So, yeah. um, the first sale, she, she made that mistake. And I think what, what they did was they made the appointments time shorter. Um, you know, instead of like an hour and a half, you only have like 45 minutes or an hour. Or something right. like that. And I think that was her plan. But I went to the first one and, um, oh, I saw you there. Yeah. I went to the one and, and that was it. It was enough for me. But, it, you know, I didn't feel unsafe. No. I, I think that she was running the times. I think, I think we had two hours to shop and like you said, I think she shortened that down because by the time you're an hour and a half into it, people are done shopping and the place is kind of emptying out. Because most people get there in the first 10 minutes of their of their time their time slot. They don't come pouring in at the last minute. And so she she did work on that. But I heard the second time she did it, they had some kind of road construction, unexpected road construction. And people yeah. were literally going like on their dirt road to get to her house. Yeah, I heard uh, about it. Yeah. And, and it was like a long way out of the way to get there. So that turned, turned into a fiasco, but she still did very well on both of those cells. And uh, I, I think that if we did a time slot thing where we could control the population coming in, that we would fill every time slot with people. We wouldn't have a problem filling it, you know. But I think it'd still be less people than if we just had an open gate and people can just pour in in whatever numbers they want to. You know, I think that, that, that there's no way you can match that, that kind of a turnout where you don't throttle it at all. Right. But yesterday there was a lot of people there. I was surprised. What? Why can't we see you? Oh, I've got my camera turned off. I figured. Yeah. It's Scott. It's me. I'm here. I got a year. I, last haircut I had was a year ago. So I keep cutting it here and cutting it there from time to time. And but every time I get ready to go, they shut them down again. So maybe next week. Yeah, and I guess James has got been able to get to the barber. Or is your wife doing it for you? No, no, I have a uh, when the little window that it was open, yeah. I got my and my hair doesn't grow fast anyway, and it's actually getting kind of long, but there's not much of it, so it looks good, just like uh, that. I I was shipping some some plants some people bought, and I had to go over to the post office to send them out, and right next to the post office, a guy just opened up a a, a barber shop. And he was in there and he was cutting the guy's hair. So I asked him and he said, he's kind of busy that day. And I said, well, I'll come back, you know, I'll come back on Thursday at nine o'clock. I called him. He said, he'd be there at nine o'clock. I got there at five to nine. I waited till 20 after nine. He, he never showed up. And I just drove over and it's like, you know, damn it. And the next week they shut the, the barbers down again. So they're open again now. I don't know if I'm going to go back to that guy, but I, I got to find a guy to get a haircut here soon. Yeah. Either that or I'm just going to take it all down to the scalp because the way it's going, if I had done that, Eight months ago, it would have been grown out. I'd have, you know, your hair length now, James, by now, if I just buzzed it. I should have yeah. just buzzed it down with my, with my, uh, my uh, razor. Yeah. So. Hey, guys, I'm going to let you go. Yeah. But, uh, I'm going to send a meeting. Email, uh, and, uh, you know, we'll figure out a meeting uh, on the 13th or 
15th, whatever day that, I don't know what day the 14th or 15th is, but uh, in a couple of weeks. 14th is next Sunday, which is Valentine's Day. Are you guys are thinking about doing this real soon? Um, I would like to start planning it soon. Okay. If it's better to do it like in April or something like that. As far, part of our like spring sale or something like that, we could do that instead. I just yeah. want to get ahead of the other clubs, to be honest with you. Um, Cornejo well, it all got, starts with a conversation. You know, you got to start talking about it before it's going to happen. So, so you would you like to get it done maybe by April? Yeah, even you know, even March. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, whoever is on the committee or whoever decides they want to help. I don't want to put too much pressure on them to have it done by next month or have it done by next sure. week. Sure. I want to have fun and it's a lot of time to throw ideas out there. Yeah, better get it done. Better do it right than to do it fast. Yeah, yeah. You could kind of whet people's appetite by sending out an email. Look what we're thinking about doing and yeah. we'd like your input. Could we do it as early as late March or should we wait until April? And plants might look better in April. I don't know. But um, what, put out teasers and remind people how easy it is to get on Zoom and that you got people who can help you teach, learn how to click on a button on your computer, which is all you have to do. Or even they can go to, well, I don't know if it's going to be safe, go to somebody's house that knows how to do it, you know. But, uh, you know, I don't know how comfortable they're going to be with that. I, I keep wanting to help the Hannahs, but they don't have any way to do it. I've thought about letting them come over here and and do, and use one of my laptops to join the meeting, but I did not like oh. COVID's going on. They can actually pull up on my driveway and they can hit my router from there. I could let them use my laptop to join the meetings. I've thought about putting that out to them. Maybe I'll do that. I don't know if they want to sit in their van while the meeting's going on. And Are you close to them? They're, they're a couple miles away from me. They're, it's about a five minute drive from here, 10 minute drive. Yeah. Without the computer, are they? They must just be so isolated. Uh, yeah, I think they're kind of used to it. You know, they they don't have uh, smartphones. Um, they barely worry, have the internet, right? I worry for them mainly because I they're I know their landlord's been sick and she might have passed away, and they had a really good relationship with her, and I know her kids are going to take over the property, and I don't know if they'll be as as good to the Hannahs as she has been. Roberta did a lot of stuff for her. She'd go to her house and every day, know, every yeah, day. She yeah. Would. Yeah. And so um, I know they had a good rapport with her. They told me that they paid her their rent directly and she had a property manager handle other properties that she rents out. But I know none of their people that they've been in kind of that close relationship with the landlord. And when they pass away, they're dealing with the kids and the, all the dynamics change after that. So who knows what will happen. I hope that it'll all stay the same for them. I was on the phone the other day with someone and they said that the Hannahs have or had COVID. Oh, wow. I haven't talked to them to, to verify that they have or haven't, but I just heard about that uh, in a conversation yesterday over the phone. So- Anybody get a shot? You guys get a shot yet? What's that? You guys get a shot yet? Have you, Amy? I had you? one. You got one. Way to go. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I can't get one yet. But, Not uh, old enough, you kids. Yeah, I'm in the next batch, Amy. I'm in the next batch, 55 to 64. I'll be there. That's yeah. so good talking to you guys. I it feels good. Thank you. Good. All right, the football game's going to get on, so I'm going to go watch that now. <laughs>